Wow, what an awesome movie. Top Gun Maverick was everything I thought it could be and much, much more. It's not often the case that a sequel can rival the first, but man, this movie may actually be better than the first in almost every way. I had seen the original when I was a little kid, so I went back and watched it again. I appreciate it way more as an adult, especially the Tony Scott cinematography of filming most scenes at the golden hour. The sequel pays homage to the original in that regard, as well as many other ways, without regurgitating the same story like some movies. I'm looking at you, Force Awakens. The story begins with showing us what Maverick has been up to since we last saw him. He's a top-secret test pilot at the Nevada Test Range. He's still the same Maverick we know and love, tempestuous and rebellious. While testing a new reconnaissance aircraft, he disobeys orders and flies the aircraft beyond its specifications. We also get a little product placement here with the Lockheed Martin logo in the cockpit. To the keen observer, this signifies propaganda, pure and simple, but I'll take it if it means I get an awesome movie. Eh, But I digress. This rebellious act lands Maverick in hot water with an admiral played by Ed Harris who can still give a convincing performance after so many years. It turns out that Maverick's old frenemy, Iceman, got him out of trouble this time by offering him an opportunity to take to the skies again and train a new generation of top gunners. At this stage, I feared the filmmakers would succumb to the tired and hackneyed trope of the youngsters showing up the old man and how wrong and toxic he was. But nope, my expectations were pleasantly subverted. These young pilots showed respect and deference to the tried and true experienced Maverick. Youngsters showing respect to their elders? In Western culture? Color me shocked. This is mana from heaven. Maverick's lessons are supervised by none other than Vice Admiral Don Draper. Uh, I mean Cyclone. What? I honestly don't think John Hamm's been given enough roles to let his acting ability shine through, which is a real shame. Not many people saw his excellent portrayal in 2018's Beirut, so I'm glad the production crew gave him a chance since he's a great, well-rounded actor that's much more than just Mad Men. The actors playing the younger pilots were all welcome surprises as well. Payback, Hangman, Fanboy, Bob, and Phoenix were all fleshed out characters with their own competitive personalities that played very well off each other. Miles Teller as Rooster understandably got the most screen time as he was Goose's surviving son. The tension between Maverick and Rooster completed a great story arc throughout the film with Maverick playing a pseudo father figure, trying to protect him, teach him, and nurture the youngster's abilities. After training was completed, the young pilots were set to go into battle alone but the film subverted my expectations yet again by having Maverick lead the untested pilots into a very dangerous mission into what looks to be North Korea, which is developing a nuclear weapon. The film never dives into politics or an agenda when it comes to this, and we never really find out which country the U.S. is entering here. And quite frankly, I'm alright with that. It's a decision that will ultimately stand the test of time. Rambo 3 made a mistake of supporting the Mujahideen, which as we all know hasn't really aged well. I'm glad Top Gun Maverick didn't touch politics with a 10-foot pole, as I'm sure it would also not have aged very well. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Jennifer Connelly here. The original movie had Kelly McGillis as Maverick's love interest and giving the female audience a hook to watch. McGillis wasn't called back for the sequel, although Penny is a welcome addition. I thought it was a nice touch recalling that Maverick had hooked up with the Admiral's daughter and having that end up being Jennifer Connelly was great. I'm glad they went with her because Connelly is aged very gracefully into the character. And let's face it, she's very good on the eyes. Gotta love those Irish jeans. The film ends with a fantastic aerial battle sequence flying in and basically repeating the trench run on the Death Star in Star Wars, this time without the Millennium Falcon flying in to save the day. I will say that, without divulging any spoilers, the end of the battle struck me as a little improbable, but hey, that's what makes good cinema, getting you into the action with the stakes being very high. The film was very tightly written without feeling very rushed. Scenes both on the ground and in the air were very competently shot. The effort truly shines through for a great thrill ride. The film delivers some crazy aerial acrobatics without the use of CGI and in a time where just about every movie is green screened. It was really refreshing to see practical effects on screen. 
Of course, there was some CGI added here and there, but it wasn't overwhelming. This made the film much, much more immersive, and it felt like you were on a roller coaster, and it was a great ride. Overall, this was my favorite film, not just this year, but in quite a while. It paid its respects to the past without rehashing the prior storyline, it opened itself up to new opportunities without disrespecting the past, and it kept itself largely free of politics or an agenda. Although a keen observer would note that its hidden meaning was to expose how radically underprepared America is in modern warfare. This type of propaganda is free from the jingoism and general America rah 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 tropes that have been overdone so many times, and I'm absolutely cool with that. It makes the film feel much more grounded and realistic than a lot of the live action cartoons we've been subjected to lately. Paying respect to the past was also done with grace and thoughtfulness especially the few short scenes we got with Val Kilmer, which were done with taste. Over the years, Val Kilmer's retreated from the spotlight due to his unfortunate struggle and illness with throat cancer, which is a shame as he played one of the most memorable characters in cinematic history in the original movie. So it was quite nice seeing him revived here in a poignant yet caring and compassionate manner, which gave the film additional heart. And speaking of heart, the fact that Tom Cruise came out before the film and thanked the fans for seeing the movie spoke volumes. Showing respect and deference to the fans counts, and when people see that, they tend to reward that as we saw with the box office returns. It reminded me of a time when I flew to Colorado to go hiking and camping in August of 2020, and a stewardess came up to me, eyes tear-filled, thanking me personally for choosing to fly during that very difficult time. It made me appreciate her efforts more. Tom Cruise and that stewardess personalized the experience for me by showing respect and gratitude. Hollywood could really learn something here. Talk to me, Goose. Should I see this movie? Heck yes. I'd very much recommend seeing this movie, especially on the big screen, as it's a great, fun thrill ride for everyone. And I will show my respect and deference to my fans here by thanking you for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider giving it a like and a subscribe for more videos reviewing all sorts of pop culture.